Paul. Um, so yeah, hopefully he'll join soon and then we'll begin once he does join. Um, so yeah, just take his time to get a drink, relax. Hopefully he will join. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep the chat updated anyway. And we did uh, just post a link in the chat for you to ask questions. Here he is. Hello. Hello, hello. Um, my apologies for being late. I couldn't get it to connect. <laughs> and eventually I tried a number of times and it worked this time. So I don't know why that was. Yeah, but that's not least... a problem anyway. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. It's a great honour. Um, and hopefully we'll have a very good event lined up for you. Um, I think we'll start straight away. We've got people still joining, but um, that's fine. And we will be recording this event, if that's OK. That's absolutely fine. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, so anyway, hello, everyone, and welcome to our first speaker event for our new 21, um, 2021 to 2022 speaker series. I am delighted to welcome the Leader of the House of Commons and Lord President of the Council, Jacob Rees-Mogg, to the virtual stage. Now, before we start, I'll just remind our audience that we are recording the event and we'll be exercising our safe space policy where, so, you know, if you use any offensive or foul language in the comments or in the chat, um, we will just remove you from the call, um, but hopefully it won't come to that. Um, and there will be time to ask questions at the end, and for that you can either use the link in the comments that we've provided for a form or you can put it directly into the comments or you can raise your hand and ask Mr. Smog directly yourself. Um, so yeah that's all quite straightforward um, and that's really all I need to say. I'll pass over to Mr. Smog now and once again thank him for attending. Well it's my absolute pleasure to join you um, and I'm glad we rearranged by a week. I, I thought last week uh, had we done it um, as the semi-final was taking place, the audience might have been a little thinned out by other pressing priorities. So, so I'm glad you're here this evening. Uh, what I thought I'd do is speak quite briefly and then open up for questions. Uh, I think Zoom works much better when it's more interactive. Otherwise, I just gas on. And I have no idea whether anybody's listening or not. Um, that th when you're with people, you can see, you see the ones who are dozing off and you realise you've got to say something more exciting. You see the ones who are throwing bread rolls at you and you need to duck. But when you're on Zoom, that's much harder to get a feel for. So um, as I say, I'll be quite brief and then we can move to questions. Uh, we're opening up next week on the 19th. And this is very important because the freedoms that we have lost are pretty fundamental ones. That if you'd said to me in January of 2020, the state would tell you who you could have dinner with, who you could let into your home, who would be allowed to go to a funeral, I would have thought you were talking about a different country. I wouldn't have thought that could possibly happen in the United Kingdom. But the problem with the removal of freedoms is that once governments do that, it's very hard to give them back because there's always a good safety first reason for saying, well, why don't we just wait a little bit? And a little bit eventually becomes longer and longer and longer until you find that the state is playing a bigger part in your life. And if you think this is being unduly alarmist, bear in mind that the final regulations for the Second World War didn't go until Harold Wilson was prime minister in the second half of the 1960s. The requirement to have identity cards went on well into the 1950s and was only stopped because of a 
a, a court action brought by one individual who refused to produce his identity card. And the courts, although upholding his fine or his, actually, I think he got a, a discharge, um, said that the purpose of the law was for the war and not for peacetime. And Parliament then reacted. So getting freedoms back is difficult. And Therefore, governments have to be bold in giving them back. And it's, it's fascinating. People are now saying, well, we don't know what to do. We need to be told. Well, no, we need to make decisions for ourselves. That's fundamental. That's how our society runs. And actually, it's very encouraging because if you wind back to when the restrictions came in, they came in very much with consent that the British people accepted that this was necessary, accepted that their parliament had passed them, and therefore there was very high compliance in this country without aggressive, um, officious enforcement. Comparatively speaking, there have been very few fines. We haven't had to have a policeman on the corner of every street. People have accepted the necessity. But because of the base of our society, our common law understanding that everything that isn't specifically prohibited is allowed, the sooner we get those powers back to individuals, the better, because they are your powers, not the state's powers, your rights, not the state's rights. And your decision making will, in the end, be better than that that the state can make on your behalf. And you get back to normalization that way. And the vaccine has obviously been very important in that context because it's sped up the rate of return of freedoms. But even without the vaccine, we couldn't have gone on forever with the rule of six and being told that we weren't allowed to invite people into our own homes. So these re relaxations had to come eventually. And I think they are coming um, reasonably uh, sensibly timed, not too early, not too late. And that if we had delayed, every time you delay, it becomes harder in the end to give them back. So that's that side of it. There's then the economic side of it. We have taken on an enormous amount of debt. And I have good news for you, ladies and gentlemen. You're the ones who are going to be paying it off because you're this nation's future. You're the ones who will be um, earning, paying taxes, working to pay off this debt that has been built up hugely over the last 15 months, taking us to 2.2 trillion pounds of debt altogether. You may not pay it all off, but you'll be servicing it during your working lives. And so we have a responsibility to get that under control and to begin to get the budget back into balance and to recognize the scale of the problem and to cut our coat according to our cloth. We cannot go on spending in the way we have had to spend in the face of a pandemic. If we were to, there would be potentially serious economic consequences. You would risk um, a number of equally bad outcomes. Potentially, I think inflation would be a very great risk if you carried on uh, with the government and the Bank of England printing money to pay for government debt, or alternatively, if the government decided to fund all its debt directly from the markets rather than from the Bank of England, you would suck so much liquidity and capital out of the markets that you would risk a deflation. Both of those would be very damaging. And so we have to try and get this balance right and begin to start the process of getting expenditure under control. Though I'm glad uh, that the country is in your hands in future, because I'm sure that your success, your economic success, your drive, your ambition following on from the great education that you are getting will be a way of ensuring that our future prosperity is guaranteed. But we shouldn't be um, negligent about the economic worries that we have at the moment. And then I think there are the constitutional issues that we face as we're looking at the reality of governing ourselves again. And I think this is really exciting because what we've done is reinvigorated democracy. How you vote determines how we're governed and the laws that are made. And this is, I think, constitutionally good in an absolute sense. But it also holds politicians' feet to the fire. Bear in mind, a few years ago, I could write to constituents who got in touch with me about trade issues or procurement issues or agricultural issues. And so there's nothing I can do about that. It's nothing to do with me. It's all decided elsewhere. Now, that responsibility rests with our elected representatives. So anything that you want changed or you want put right 
your MP, and that may be you in future, when you've been elected to Parliament, which I'm sure some of you will in due course, you're in charge or your MP is in charge and therefore has no escape clause to say, I can't do anything about that. You've got to um, go somewhere else to get things changed. So I think that brings a more immediate democracy, um, re-enfranchises the British people. And again, I think it will lead to better decision making because to go back to where I started on individual responsibility, you need to ask the question of who do you think will run your life better? Will it be better run by you with all the knowledge you have about your own circumstances, your own ambitions, your own desires? And will it be run better by you in cooperation with your family and the community around you? Or is it better if you're directed centrally? The aim comes from the collective to tell you how to contribute to the collective. And I think as a politician, my job is to allow you to make the choices you want as freely as possible and to take the obstacles out of the way of the path that you want to go down. So I think it's so important that we um, build more houses so that you will be able to buy your own house in the not too distant future. What I don't think it's my job to do is to say, well, actually, I know best, and therefore I will signpost the route you should take. I will put diversions along the route you must take to make you go in the way that I think is in the interest of the collective. And that ultimately is the difference between the conservative and the socialist. The socialist believes that the interest of the collective is best served by collective direction, whereas the conservative believes that the collective society, the nation, is best served by the random decisions of individuals who know what is best for them and their families and their society, making those decisions for themselves and being encouraged to do so and free to do so. And so that's the basic message that underpins the removal of the restrictions, underpins our feeling that we should be economically responsible because it's a burden that falls on individuals uh, eventually and means that constitutionally, we want to have effective democracy, direct democracy, empowered democracy, so that you are determining the future destiny of your country. I think that's long enough for an introduction, particularly as all I see is a whole um, panel of sets of initials. So whether behind those initials there are real people listening, I have no idea, but I hope there are. Uh, and I will now hand back to the chairman for questions. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. And I think there's definitely a lot to discuss from it. Um, we've got lots of questions coming into the form and I'll remind you all that you can just raise your hands and then I will um, say that you can speak and you can direct your question directly to Mr. Rees Mogg. Um, and I'll ask this first question now. Um, so with COVID case rates over 40,000 per day, would it not be prudent to continue the small imposition of legally mandated mask wearing on public transport and inside of shops and facilities to protect those vulnerable, such as cancer patients or those unable to take a vaccine? Isn't the abandonment of mandatory mask wearing, as Nicola Sturgeon suggested, the abandonment of the vulnerable? Um, no, it isn't. I think it's really sensible to allow people to exercise their own judgment. Um, I came from Somerset up to London uh, for the um, cricket match last week between uh, England and Pakistan. And I travelled back by train uh, on a Saturday and I was the only person other than my son um, in the carriage. And therefore, what on earth was the point of wearing a mask? Who was I protecting? I wore my mask because it was mandated by law, but I wouldn't wear a mask in those circumstances. If, on the other hand, the train had been absolutely full and standing room only, then you might think it is sensible, it is polite to wear a mask. If you take a taxi in London, there is a screen, there's a perspex screen between you and the driver. What is the point of the mask? There isn't one. On the other hand, if you're in um, a, a private hire vehicle that doesn't have a screen, uh, the sort of taxis that are very common outside London, you may feel that you're so close to the driver that you do want to wear a mask. But I think we can make those decisions very well for ourselves. And if you've been vaccinated, the risk of you transmitting the virus are very, very significantly reduced. It's not only your risk of getting it is reduced, so is your risk of transmitting it. So that's a double benefit, your, your lower risk of catching it and then if you've caught it, a lower risk of transmitting it. So um, the risks have gone down because of vaccination. And actually, I think you are all able to make these decisions for yourselves. 
Thank you. And I would just add to that that surely with mask wearing, one individual wearing a mask is not actually what will protect them. It is all the individuals around them also wearing masks that will protect them. And that has been sort of proved by science. And therefore, leading on to this other question, is liberty more important than life? Um, I think COVID made this sort of that philosophy quite evident when we decided um, to sort of sacrifice the collective liberty in order to preserve the life of the many. Um, what would you say to that? Um I think the restrictions that we had over the last year were extremely reasonable and were the right decision uh, because of the um, spread of the pandemic and the high death rates that there were before the nation was vaccinated. Um, but we obviously don't put an absolute on this, do we? That, that um, there is a balance of risk. There is risk in life. If we didn't accept risk in life, none of us would ever get into a motor car or go on a bus, or go on a train. Their trains are extremely low risk. None of us would ever go into our kitchen or our bathroom. We all accept that there are risks in life. And you have to balance that. Is it proportionate? And when COVID was raging through the country and there was no vaccine, to reduce the effectiveness of it, the deadliness of it, it was sensible to sacrifice liberty. But when you've got to a point where hospitalisation rates have declined very dramatically and death rates even more dramatically, it's not the business of the government to protect you from a bad cold. It is the business of the government to protect you from a high risk of death. And that is the balance. And that balance has shifted very strongly because of the vaccination programme. Thank you. Um, and now just this next question, um, alluding a bit to your um, quite funny comment that we will be the ones paying off the debt and very much a true comment as well. Um, so given the high national debt, is austerity inevitable or can we increase investment to reduce debt in the long term? Um, again, this is this is balance. We, we, we need as a matter of priority to get current spending and current income aligned. There is an argument for then having an element of debt spending uh, for long-term infrastructure programs, that that is proportionate because it has a, an economic benefit, an economic return. But um, in, in terms of uh, austerity, all governments, all nations have to live within their means to a, to a degree. Will we need the approach that was taken in 2010? No, we won't, because most of the costs for the pandemic have been one-off costs. That is to say, they were about maintaining the structures of the economy during the peak of the pandemic. Bear in mind, um, if we hadn't had the cost that we had had, thousands of businesses would have closed permanently. Almost no company can survive with no income for three months. And I doubt there's a single company that can cope with no income for six months. So the £407 billion of taxpayers' money that provided that prop for industry and employment was money essentially spent. It was well spent money. And if you look at unemployment rates, they are about half, under half what was being forecast a year ago. So that's definitely worked. But what that means is the economy is bouncing back faster and therefore the prospect of having current expenditure and current receipts matching is nearer in the future than it would have been if we hadn't spent that money. So I don't think we need 2010 style austerity but all governments always need to live within their means. Thank you. And I'm sure the government recognises that our generation in particular has been saddled with the very heavy debts of our student tuition fees already. Um, so we pay about £9,250 a year, um, and that is for most universities. Um, I wonder if you could give any examples of how the government's going to help us to pay back these debts alongside the fact that we'll probably have to cope with quite a heavy tax burden in the next 10 years at least to pay off the COVID debts. Well, I think one of the things that is um, most favourable uh, to your generation is actually going to be planning reform, because one of the great obstacles to people achieving their lifetime ambition has been that we simply haven't built enough houses. And I, I think you're right to highlight that uh, over the last year, um, the, the young have paid a very high price to protect the elderly. And I think most young people are very happy to have paid that price because they've got family members and they believe they have a position in society. But I do recognise that society has a debt to those who have um, borne the burden of the last year. And I think that means taking on the political argument 
about how you build houses, how you build houses that people can then buy, setting down homeowners earlier, uh, and providing the supply that will meet the long existing, long standing demand and make housing affordable um, so that the um, average age of people buying a house for the first time or a flat for the first time goes back down to where it was 20 years ago, rather than continuing to creep higher and higher. Thank you. And now another question. Um, so will the recent cuts to the foreign aid budget totaling a reduction of four billion pounds, which I have heard referred to as sort of the government's pocket money, not a very substantial amount considering the grand scheme of things. Um, will that seriously impede the UK's soft power abroad? And how did you justify your vote for it? No, it won't make any difference to the UK's soft power abroad. Um, our, our soft power abroad comes from all sorts of other reasons beyond our foreign aid budget. Our, uh, and a lot of our foreign aid budget, bear in mind, is still spent um, by the European Union and international organisations. So it doesn't even represent the UK soft power because it's badged with the name of other organisations. Um, uh, I'm very worried about you saying £4 billion is a small amount of money. Um, if you want us to be able to live within our means, if you don't want to have this huge debt burden around your necks um, over the next decades that, as I said earlier, you will pay off, you've got to make sure that you are looking at all areas of expenditure to see if it is both necessary and affordable. And the overseas aid budget in the context uh, of um, the pandemic and the extra costs of that was simply not affordable. Okay, thank you. And then as a sort of follow up to this question, we'll just find it here. So naturally, not every government policy will align entirely with every minister's own viewpoint. How do you square having to back policies and no public hesitation that may differ slightly from your own? And at what point would you theoretically consider a policy to differ too much from your own? And that's, a, a, if I may say, a really well phrased question, because the word slightly is crucial. Um, of course, ministers have their own views on everything, but the government must speak with one voice. It's no good if one minister says, um, yeah, I agree with you, but I'm sorry, I can't do that, but I'm sure you're right. And the other says, no, no, we must do something different. You can't hold the government to account if ministers say different things. If you're holding the government to account, ministers have to be willing to defend the whole range of government policies, whether or not they are that individual minister's personal priorities. Uh, and it is the word slight that, that um, if, if the government were to say we were going to rejoin the European Union tomorrow, people like me might find that a little difficult. If, on the other hand, you're saying um, should the cut in overseas aid be three billion, four billion or five billion, I'm quite happy to leave that decision to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. I may have a preferred view or I may not. It doesn't really matter. I'm happy to leave that to a government. Uh, fellow government minister, who will be in a better position to determine that. And likewise, I mean, my responsibility as leader of the House of Commons is prioritising business in the, in the chamber. And we have statements um, day after day made by different departments. And sometimes one department says, I'd like to go first, and the other department says, I'd like to go first too. And my office with Downing Street has to decide which one goes first. That is a slight difference, which everybody in the end will accept and say, that's just how the cookie crumbles. And so the, the slight things you just accept as part of being in a team. But if the Conservative Party suddenly said it was going to be socialist, then you'd find a lot of Conservative ministers had difficulties. And so there are big things, principled things, which go too far. But there's a lot of leeway with your colleagues in their area of specialisation. That's very interesting. And now this next question relates a bit about to, um, what you were talking about with individual responsibility. Um, so in this digital age, is direct democracy the future? Um, I think democracy gets more direct because I think the ability of people to contact their member of parliament is, is greater and the messages get through faster. Um, it's very interesting to discuss more referendums and would you like there to be, would you have liked yesterday for the vote on overseas aid to have been done electronically by 
60 million people across the country. And I'm in two minds about this. I, I'm a great believer in the wisdom of the British people. But I'm not sure that the British people spend their whole life thinking about politics. And therefore, if you move to daily referendums, you had referendums every time you had a division in the House of Commons. I'm not sure most people would actually want that to be how they were governed. So I do think there is a place for more frequent referendums. I do think there's a strong place for more engagement. But I think that most voters actually quite like delegating a lot of the routine to their elected politicians. But I'm happy to discuss that because I'm not saying I'm definitely right about that. That's definitely quite an interesting answer, actually. Um, and then just this next question, it's a bit more related to what we were just talking about earlier. So how does your Catholic faith impact your polity, policies um, and politics? Most importantly, how do you reconcile your Catholic beliefs and the closing of churches? And I might add um, your vote to cut foreign aid, because surely some of that would take the form or be akin to charity. Well, on, on charity, I think charity is primarily the responsibility of the individual, not the state. So I, I don't find any difficulty with voting to cut the foreign aid budget. Um, I was extremely uncomfortable with closing the churches. I'll make no bones about that. Um, I um, am very glad that the decision was taken in December that they would not be closed again uh, and that they would not be closed in, in future. Uh, I think there is a separation between the church and state and churches are large um, um, airy spaces by and large with plenty of airflow the risk in them was very low uh, and um, I, I was bound by collective responsibility marking back to the previous question but it was something I was not at all comfortable with. Okay that, yeah that's a very interesting answer and now just going back again to what you're we talking about um, if social media companies um, so this is also related to recent events with football which I'm sure you're fully aware about um, if social media companies were to require ID to set up an account would it be a breach of privacy in light of the recent online abuse against footballers? That's a really interesting question um, I think, as the Prime Minister was saying earlier on today, the social media companies have a big responsibility. I think their argument that they are not publishers is a hard one for them to sustain. I think they are publishers rather than merely the providers of a platform. Now, what we're doing now on Zoom is a platform. But there is no filtering of what we're saying. There is um, uh, no, no um, algorithm working out my words and then sending me an advert in two minutes time but the social media companies use their algorithms to personalize adverts they can pick up anything that you search for you put in all of this to find out what your interests are focus promotions towards you if they can do that it seems to me that they can pick out things that are criminally offensive that is to say incite racial hatred or suggest violence and that they ought to be doing that. Um, I do think there is a problem with anonymity on social media. Uh, I think that it uh, encourages people to think that they can uh, hide behind a veil of secrecy and say things that are much more abusive than they would ever say if they were to meet somebody and be expected to say it face to face. And you know this as a member of parliament, this hasn't changed. Um, Members of Parliament get anonymous letters. Anonymous letters are always the most vile, abusive letters because the person doesn't have the courage to put his or her name to the letter. I mean, my mind goes straight into the bill. I, I don't even see the anonymous letters. What's the point? Um, and social media has that effect. But, so yes, so that pushes you towards saying people should be identified. But on the other hand, what if you're a whistleblower working inside a business that you think is doing really serious harm and to reveal what's going on because you're frightened your company will take reprisals against you or you're in the government and you're frightened the government will take reprisals against you or you're in the police force and you're worried that the police will take reprisals against you. What if you really feel that to do that you have to be anonymous? So. I'm not really giving you an answer because I'm quite torn on this. I, I, I think you can see circumstances where anonymity is beneficial. 
but it is unquestionably abused. I think you best get round it by recognising that the social media companies are publishers and they have a responsibility as publishers, whether things are uh, anonymous or named. OK, thank you. Um, I'm sure we'll probably come back to that with more questions about it. Um, and the next one we've got, and this does relate a lot to what the sort of general points we've been making um, about our generation being saddled with the, the debt of coronavirus and having to pay that back. Um, and why do you think that the Conservative Party is more unpopular with younger voters? And do you perhaps think that the performance of the opposition currently could push more younger voters towards the Conservatives? <laughs> um, that's a very good way of putting it. I, I think partly um, we haven't engaged enough. Uh, thank you for having me on this evening. Um, I saw in the 2017 general election that Jeremy Corbyn was spending the whole election speaking to younger people, and the Conservatives were not speaking to younger people at all. They just assumed you wouldn't vote and therefore it didn't matter. I think that was very bad politics. I think that people's vote changes over, over their lifetime, that you know people don't stick to the same party from the age of 18 until the end of their life, but that I think we have to make an effort to go out and explain what Conservatism is about, and we have to try and win people over in that way. But then we have to show why our policies will actually help you lead the life that you want to lead. Why well, I brought up housing in this context, because um, if I were with you, I would ask you the question of which one of you wants to own his or her own home by the age of 35. Every time I've raised this question with a university, I've had an almost unanimous response saying that people want to. Indeed, I was speaking in one university and there was a group from Momentum in the audience who'd come along to listen to me very kindly. And they all wanted to own their own homes by the age of 35 too. So it's not just a conservative ambition. It's an ambition that is, I think, almost innate. And so we have to make the case about how our principles help people lead the lives they want to lead and then specific policies that will help. Jeremy Corbyn was in a way more appealing to younger voters than... Keir Starmer is. He's a more charismatic figure. Um, and perhaps real socialism is more appealing to younger people than sort of more Blairite socialism. But I don't think that takes away the challenge from the Conservatives to get out there and make our case and explain. OK, thank you very much. Um, and then now, relating a bit more maybe to the direct democracy question, um, how do you think politicians ought to go about correcting their public image in an age where many see them as corrupt? Well, and I think someone did actually um, put in a survey, a recent poll of 2,600 individuals found that only 13% of people trusted politicians, with 37% saying that they actively distrusted MPs. Yes. Um, I'm afraid I, my answer on that is not a very encouraging one. Uh, but I think as long as there have been politicians, politicians have got this sort of rating that you go back to Cicero and you find he's saying something about how politicians are badly thought of. You go back um, more recently to Dr. Johnson, who was a friend of Edmund Burke and great figures like that, saying, why are there no longer any decent politicians as there were in the reign of Charles I? There is a tendency to look back to previous politicians and call them statesmen and look at our own lot and think that they are venal and in it for nefarious purposes. Some of you, I hope, will go into politics. And as you do, I expect you will see that you're not going into it for bad purposes and that the people you meet aren't going into it in, for bad purposes, even the ones you disagree with. My current shadow is Thangam Debonair. The predecessor was Valerie Vaz. They are both staunch supporters of the Labour Party. They are both completely decent people, honest people, good people, who simply want to change the world in a different way from the way I want to change it. But we both want to make, all three of us want to make people's lives better. And so I think as you get more involved, you see the reality that politicians uh, aren't as bad as they appear to be, but that um, it's not actually a bad thing for people to be cautious about their politicians. We don't want a deferential society where we think there's this sort of priestly caste that knows best. We want to hold our politicians to account, to question them, to get them to justify what they're doing. So I think partly it was ever thus, partly it's not such a bad thing, but the truth is very, very different. 
I think that's such a, yeah, that's a very interesting response, actually. I don't think I've thought about it from that angle in particular. And I can see we've got a question from Peter Bamfield here. Um, so, Peter, if you'd just like to unmute yourself or turn your camera on um, and ask the question. Hi, Jacob. Um, my question relates to um, the idea of direct democracy and how this could actually happen. Um, one of the big problems with the Brexit referendum was that everyone could say that people's votes meant different things. So both sides could say, well, actually, this is the type of Brexit that people want. If you were to have referenda regularly, um, that could theoretically get rid of that. But people could still say that how it was implemented was not the way that people wanted. Whereas if you just have politicians, it's sort of it's, it's on them and they can say, well, this is the decision that we think is right. How do you think you could get away from that if you did go to direct democracy? Yes. Um... The, the the one way you could do that is by legislating first and having the referendum second. So, so that you say, as we did with the alternative vote, the legislation for the alternative vote was passed and then it went to a referendum. And if the referendum had gone yes, the alternative vote would have come in automatically and it was no, so that bit of law just um, faded away. So you can do it that way, which is is perhaps clearer. But that's not possible on things like leaving the European Union or um, independence for Scotland. That is an answer that you have to work out how it's dealt with in practice after you've had the vote. And so I suppose you end up with a mix of direct democracy, referendums and representative democracy, the politicians making the decisions. And that's what you've got with the referendum, I think, because you had the referendum 2016. You had an interesting election in 2017 when, bear in mind, both parties, Labour and Tories, said they would implement the referendum. And then it became clear by 2019 that that wasn't true and that neither party was really going to implement the referendum. So Boris Johnson leading a very different type of Conservative Party, one with a clear mandate to deliver the referendum result. And so you've got the coming together of direct democracy uh, and representative democracy. And that's probably inevitable. I don't know, perhaps you may know more than I do about how they make referendums work in Switzerland, where they have so many of them, and what they do to implement the result of a referendum. I know some of them, I mean, they, they've had, they voted some years ago to stop uh, freedom of movement with the EU, and that then never really happened because it never got implemented. And so I, I don't know the extent to which the Swedish authorities can ignore referendums or implement them in a way that doesn't necessarily satisfy people. Uh, thank you. Does Pete want to say anything else? Uh, that's very interesting. I, I didn't know about the um, Swiss situation, but I will look into it. Um, but yeah, that's a very good point about legislating first. Um, yeah, I, yes. Doesn't really help with the Scottish question, though, does it, as you point out? No, um, that, that, that's right. I mean, I, I um, the, the um, pro-Europeans kept on saying I'd wanted a second referendum, uh, which was misleading because what I'd actually said is that you should, David Cameron should have gone to the British people and said, would you like me to have a renegotiation or leave the European Union and have a referendum to give him a mandate to go out and discuss it and then come back and say, okay, this is what I've achieved. Do you like it or not? And if you like it, that's what we'll continue with. If you don't like it, we will leave. And you would have had it all in the final vote, mapping it out to a final vote. I, I was never in favour of a second referendum once you decided to go down the route of a yes or no in or out referendum, because that would have been a real cheat on the electorate to say, well, we don't much like your decision, so you'd better vote again. But if you'd structured it like that in the first place, making it clear to people there would be two votes if the first vote was yes, then it was a perfectly reasonable and democratic thing to do. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for elaborating. Thank you, Peter. Um, and now just sort of relating that, um, since you mentioned the Scottish question, um, given that Scottish independence and Irish unification are perhaps looking more likely now than they have ever really. Um, will this government be the one that presides over the breaking up of the union because of its handling of Brexit amongst other divisive policies? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, 
I, it's very interesting that, that um, the opinion polling in Scotland seems to have changed. And so suddenly the SNP has gone quite quiet on the prospect of, a, of another referendum. But I think Brexit's actually very important for uh, revitalising the union because whilst we were in the EU, things were decided at the European level or the devolved level. There was very little that was happening anymore in London. And if you were the devolved Minister for Agriculture, you had to go and see the London Minister for Agriculture, who would then make your case in Brussels. And you could see the logic of saying, well, why don't we cut out London, just go directly, because either it's devolved or it's EU competence, other than a few bits and pieces, and some important bits and pieces, but nonetheless, a few bits and pieces. Um, and now that's all changed. It's now either devolved or it's UK-wide. So trade, procurement, um, subsidy policy, health and safety, employment law, all of that is now back to being UK-wide law. And you see, therefore, the logic of having a union that agrees trade deals together and so on and so forth. And so I think that will help the union, particularly things like getting back fish, which will be potentially very important for the Scottish economy, makes it a more Norwegian style economy. Um, and they will have control of their territorial waters. If they went back into the European Union, they'd lose all that again, which would be a strange thing to do. So I think the logic of the United Kingdom is being reasserted. OK, thank you. And then this next question sort of relating to that, and I know we already focused on talking about debt, but I would like to maybe broaden this out a bit, maybe think more globally for this question. Um, what will a post-COVID UK look like? Huh, that's a very hard question. Um, In your opinion, what, what would your ideal be, perhaps? I, I think there are many bits that will go back to being the same. I think we'll all be very glad to see each other more freely again. But I think we will use technology more. Um, if you take this call this evening, I couldn't possibly have come to you in person uh, on a Wednesday evening. Um, I, I couldn't have got from London fast enough. I was um, in a meeting with the chief whip until seven o'clock. Then I had a couple of votes. Then I just managed to get home, failed to connect the first couple of times I tried and finally got on properly. Um, but, but unless I could be teleported, I wouldn't have got to, 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 to Warwick in the, in the time available. And you will then have a choice. You'll say, um, will you do this on Zoom or will you not be able to come or will you come in 18 months time when you've got a Friday evening that you can actually do? And, and those choices become much more real. Uh, uh, 15 months ago, it wouldn't have occurred to you to invite me to appear remotely. Uh, this event just wouldn't have taken place. So I think we will learn from that. But I still think we'll value the personal contact, the actual meeting of people. So some things will return to normal, but we will use some of what we've had. Um, we will, in the way of these things, in future, be perfectly prepared for a COVID pandemic. But whether we're prepared for whatever it is that actually happens is another matter. It's a great habit of nations to prepare for what happened the last time round, uh, rather than trying to think, what will the next crisis be? And perhaps that's because it's harder to predict, harder to, to work out. I mean, it's, it's a bit, bit like the Maginot line that um, the French didn't think that the, um, uh, the, the, the Germans would come the route that they did and therefore not need to go through the Maginot lines. You've got the wrong bit defended. Um, so I think, I think you will see a lot of going back to normal, but also things that we have accepted becoming normal. Yeah, I think it's definitely something quite interesting to think about. And then this next question, just leading on to that, um, how do you think history will judge the current government um, for its actions? So during World War II, um, history has judged the government very favourably um, for its actions during World War II, for example. Um, but during this coronavirus pandemic, we've been able to compare a lot with other countries. Um, and even whilst our death toll cannot necessarily be directly comparable, we can still agree that it's a very high death toll. Um, so how do you think history will judge Boris Johnson? And of course, that considers the fact that we aren't actually out of the pandemic yet and we might still have a very long way to go. Um that, that, that's right, which is why I'd slightly ask you to hang fire on, on judging it. Um, and we will need to look at the studies that will come out um, in due course, explaining why some countries had such a different experience, even when they 
tried very similar things. Um, and, and it seems that there are all sorts of factors that have determined whether you've had a good or bad COVID experience. Um, urbanization seems to be one of them, that, that countries with low density populations seem to have suffered less than countries with high density populations. But then when you look at the Far East with high density populations, they've managed not to suffer comparatively as much. You look at the economic decisions that were made, you will face the burden of paying off that debt. But will history, as I think it will, recognize that as being very successful? Or will you, when you're paying off that debt, say, well, they didn't need to go so far or they should have gone further? That will be hard to tell. So far, in comparison with other countries, our economic performance coming out of it is strong. Our economic performance going down appeared weak. But there's quite an important, I use the word appeared very carefully. And this is where looking at it in the round is going to be so important. Um, our GDP figures are on the basis that if a teacher goes into a school and there's no pupils in the classroom, there's nobody being taught, that does not count as a contribution to GDP. Lots of other countries, because the teacher is still being paid, that counts as a contribution to GDP. And that's one of the reasons, if not the main reason, our decline in GDP appeared sharp, sharper than other countries, because actually the rigor of counting public service activity, if the public service activity was being paid for but not received, we didn't count it, but most other countries did. And so there'll need to be a lot of work done to work out what is real and death rates are going to be part of that. How did we record compared to other countries? Um, did we over record or under record? Um, what were other countries doing? And we'll also need to look at the, the vaccine issue and how well that has, has worked and the success of that. And as you say, there may still be some time before uh, we know that it's all over anyway. Will we need a third inoculation? No, I'm probably the only one on this call who's had two inoculations. I don't know if any of you have even had one yet. I um, haven't tested it, actually. <laughs> excellent. Well done. That, it's very public spirited of you. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's very important to, to, to have them for society. Um, but the risk to younger people is, as you all know, very limited. Hmm. And then just relating to that theme of history, um, I'm a history and politics student myself. Um, how do you think that history should be taught in schools, um, given that I think upon studying at degree, um, many students discover quite a lot of holes that have been left in their history education from both perspectives um, and in terms of the periods that they studied at school. Um, and just British identity alone, for example, um, that we've learned a very sort of limited and niche view of British identity um, in schools and that perhaps that could be expanded because history is not necessarily a very popular subject, but I'm sure you would agree a very important one. Yes, um, I'm very suspicious of teaching British identity or Britishness as a thing. I, I, I think that that's for us to develop and evolve for ourselves. I actually think it's rather un-British to teach people to be British, if you see what I mean. Um, I've read much more history since I've left university than I ever read at university. Um, and I've read a greater range as well. I, I read a lot of biographies. I enjoy biographies. I, I enjoy the history of people. But I always find the biographies that I get the most out are ones where I have the skeleton of the period in my mind so that I know what fits in with what. And therefore, I think it is important to teach uh, the basic dates and the... Uh, the, the, not that all your history should be kings and queens, but if you know the kings and queens, you then know the things that slot in and you begin to know some of the interrelationships. I think that's an important foundation. And I think before you need to know the history of other countries, it's useful to have an understanding of where your own nation has come from. And then you can form judgments and you can read around it rather than having to be taught a particular view. I, I, and then it's a matter of taste. Uh, I mean, I am, I've never been one for reading about battles. Uh, I'm more interested in the political side of it. What was the consequence of the battle? Not how were the troops deployed on the battlefield? I, that never gripped me. That didn't grip me when I was a nine-year-old and still doesn't grip me. 
but the battle was lost, the king fell, the country changed. This was what happened next. I've always found that bit very interesting. And that, that is that is personal personal choice. Hmm. No, complete. I find that very interesting. And we do have a few minutes left, so I'll just encourage anyone who does have a question to either submit it or raise their hand to ask it directly. Um, we've got much a much more sort of serious question now, um, and one that is incredibly relevant considering um, the aftermath of the Euro's loss. Um, so, to what extent is the Tory party responsible for the current rise, 256% in England and Wales in the last 12 months of racism? Um, well, I, I don't think that there's any connection between the rise in racism and the Conservative Party. I'd also dispute the figures that, that um, uh, I don't know how you calculate those sorts of figures. Um, I don't know where you would get them from. What, what does it mean to have a rise of that kind? But if you're talking about things that are, are reported, that very often depends on reporting. And actually, when you're tackling a problem, you get more reporting because people think it's worth reporting. And so I, I don't think that straight figure tells you anything. But no, I think just look at the cabinet. Is the most diverse cabinet in our history, and there's been these ridiculous attacks on 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 Priti Patel, who has herself been the victim of racist abuse throughout her political career, and I think this is quite extraordinary that she should be attacked by the Labour Party by Keir Starmer, um, in in Prime Minister's questions today, when she herself has been a victim of this. She understands it much better than um, Keir Starmer or I could understand it. And, and so, no, I, I think you need to judge by actions and look at the cabinet, look at the Tory party. And it is, I'll tell you one very interesting thing. I read in the paper that a very large number of the England football team had one grandparent who was born outside the United Kingdom. And did you see that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, it may surprise you to know I am in exactly that category too. My grandmother, my father's mother was born in the United States. And so I, I think when you dig into it, you realize that there is much more connection, closeness to immigration uh, than may be apparent on, on the surface. Um, and I think, I think we mustn't confuse the politics of the United Kingdom with the politics of the United States. I think we have so much better um, a, a, a history in this regard. We've always been a more tolerant country. And in truth, I want to get to the point where it's so natural to have a multiracial society that we stop identifying people by their race, that we look at people as who they are, not as to um, their skin color. And I think we are getting there. We're not there yet, but we are getting there. And then just as a follow up, and um, we have five minutes, minutes left, by the way, everyone, so do get any questions in. Um, we'll just be going a little bit quicker now. Um, as a follow up to that, how would you define gesture politics? Um, because I saw on Twitter, it seems to be people um, railing against gesture politics that seems to be part of the crux of the current issue. Um, well, I, I think Twitter is itself gesture, gesture politics. I, I wouldn't take Twitter too seriously. I think it's very easy to, to get into a social media uh, bubble. Um, but Twitter is, if, if Twitter were the British people, Jeremy Corbyn would be prime minister. I, I, yeah, I think that's probably quite an accurate way of looking at it, actually. Um, I'll just look through any more questions that we've missed. Okay, so there's one here. Um, has the government become alienated from the England team after its failure to support them and the criticism of their stand against racism by taking the knee? So this is related to what we were just talking about, of course. Um, and is the racism received on social media against players like Marcus Rashford proof that our government is a facilitator of racism? No, I, I don't think it is at all. I, I think this is a, a mistaken view. I think that... Um, Everybody in the country cheered for the England team uh, on Sunday night. They, they did amazingly well. They were very courageous uh, in, in their efforts, and they were almost extremely successful. 
And I think there's a huge amount of admiration for that and for the leadership showed um, by, by Mr. Southgate. Uh, and um, I don't think there's any alienation or um, close association. I, I think that the whole country was united in supporting the, the football team. Because mm, I did see recently that the England team, I think, refused to meet with Boris Johnson after the match, um, quoting, um, I think one of them said that he had been cancelled. I didn't see that. OK. Uh, OK, I think, I mean, the time is nearly up, so if anyone does have any questions and just, OK, oh, Peter Banfield again. Um, which if, if no one else has anything, I'm happy to keep asking. Yeah, can finish off with this, yeah. Um, do you think that politicians are sort of forced to become too wedded to their policies or their ideas in that if they say something, the media will force them sort of to keep to that rather than sort of grow or change um, as they learn more about the subject or as they progress? Oh, I, I think it is a genuine problem with politics that, that, that people quote things back at you that you said years and years ago uh, as if it's Hayley Writ. Now, um, I think politics is about discussing ideas and as you have discussions with people, your ideas develop, they evolve, they change. I, I mean, we have these discussions and you may think it's sort of one way and that I'm um, giving my answers, not really listening. But that's not true. I get questions when I do these events that make me think and make me think, am I right? Should I be saying something else? Should policy evolve? Is there an error in what I am saying that... Um, could be put right. Now, I'm not saying you're suddenly going to convert me into being a socialist. You're not. You're obviously not. And there will be some consistencies. But if five years ago I was worried about deflation and today I'm worried about inflation, that is simply looking at the circumstances and making a judgment. It's not inconsistent. If I thought that, um, uh, um, I don't know, trying trying to think of, of uh, uh, an example that... Um, um, George Osborne was right to um, raise the income tax threshold in 2010 and onwards, but now I think it's right to freeze the increase in the income tax threshold. Is that inconsistent? No, it's just adapting to the circumstances. Um, uh, yesterday, we voted to get rid of evil from the House of Commons, and that's E-V-E-L. We would naturally vote to get rid of E-V-I-L under all circumstances, but not necessarily. <laughs> Not necessarily would that be affected by voting House Commons. That's English votes for English laws. Um, most of the people who were happy to get rid of it yesterday uh, had supported its introduction in 2015. And there you go. And that, that's just circumstances change. Um, uh, but you're quite right. There is a faintly absurd pressure for politicians to agree with everything that they have ever said. And, and as one stays in politics longer and longer, it becomes harder and harder, not least because... With the internet, practically everything you say is still immediately available. And, and I, I actually think the electorate's more serious-minded than that. And that if you say to voters, look, actually, I've changed my mind, I think we should do X rather than Y, voters, uh, voters are pretty sophisticated. And I think that's quite a good note to end it on. Um, uh, thank you, Peter, for that question. And of course, thank you to Mr. Rees Mogg for attending today. And it was a great pleasure to have you. Um, and hopefully, we will be running many more of these events in the future. Um, and of course, we will be posting the recording of this onto our social media channels and our YouTube channel um, so that anyone who didn't attend can see it again. Or of course, you guys can re watch it because it was very interesting. Um, <laughs> it's definitely given me a lot to think about. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you. I was just thinking if anyone suffers terribly from insomnia, they can listen to my collected editions on YouTube. But thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Goodbye.